Chapter 7 Nitya Dharma and Material Existence Over the ages, countless goldsmiths had lived in the ancient mercantile town of Saptagram on the bank of the Saraswati River. By Sri Nityananda Prabhu's mercy, since the time of Sri Udharanadatta, these merchants had become addicted to Harinam Sankirtan. One of them, however, was a very miserly person named Chandidas, who used to abstain from Harikirtan with the townspeople because he was afraid of having to spend money for sponsoring festivals. Chandidas had managed to accumulate a good deal of wealth through stingy dealings. His wife, Damayanti, had adopted the same mood and did not extend even the least hospitality to Vaishnavas or other guests. This merchant couple in their youth had given birth to four sons and two daughters. Their daughters had both married, and a vast inheritance was reserved for their sons. If saintly people never visit a house, the children in it are less likely to become kind and compassionate. As the sons grew up, they became increasingly selfish and began to wish that their parents would die so that they could have their inheritance. The merchant couple became extremely unhappy. One by one the sons were married. As their wives grew older, they imbibed their husbands' natures and also began to wish that their parents-in-law would die. After some time, the sons became proficient in business and began to oversee the buying and selling very expertly. Dividing up most of their father's wealth, they set up their own businesses. One day, Chandidas called everyone to his side and said, Listen, I have lived a frugal existence since childhood, and as a result I have managed to set aside a great fortune for all of you. I have never eaten fine food or dressed in luxurious clothes, and your mother has also lived in a similar manner. It is your duty to care for us now that we are growing old, but we have become increasingly distressed recently because we have begun to feel that you are neglecting us. I still have some hidden wealth, and I will give it to whichever of my sons will be good enough to take care of us. Chandidas's sons and daughters-in-law heard his words silently, and then went off to a separate place to conspire amongst themselves. They concluded, it will be best to send mother and father away, and then take possession of their hidden wealth and divide it amongst ourselves, for there is really no telling to whom the old man will give it to unjustly. All of them were sure that the wealth was buried in their father's bedroom. One morning at dawn, Chandidas's eldest son, Hari Charan, went to his father and with feigned humility said, Dear father, you and mother should go and take darshan of Sri Navadweep Dham at least once so that your human life will become successful. I have heard that no other holy place is as beneficial in this age of Kali as Sri Navadweep Dham. It will not be troublesome or expensive for you to go there, and if you are unable to walk, we can hire you a boat to take you upstream for a nominal fee. There is also a Vaishnavi who would be happy to accompany you there. When Chandidas informed Damayanti about their son's proposal, she became very happy. Both of them concluded, Our children have become thoughtful and courteous since our talk that day. We are strong enough to walk, so let us make the pilgrimage to Sridham Navadweep via Kalna and Shantipur. Having selected an auspicious day, the couple set out on their pilgrimage, taking the Vaishnavi with them. The next day, after walking a good distance, they arrived at Ambika Kalna. There they cooked for themselves in a shop and sat down to eat. While they were taking their meal, a resident of Saptagram, who knew them, approached and informed them, your sons have broken the lock to your room and have taken all your possessions. They will not allow you to re-enter the house. They have also found your hidden wealth and have divided it amongst themselves. When Chandidas and Damayanti received this news, they were stricken with grief over the loss of their wealth. They were unable to eat a single morsel and spent the entire day crying incessant tears. The Vaishnavi attendant tried to console them, saying, Don't be attached to your home. Come, you can take up the life of Vaishnava ascetics. Build a simple ashram where Vaishnavas can gather and live. The children for whom you have sacrificed everything have become your enemies. 
so there is no need to return home. Let us go to Navadweep and remain there. You can maintain yourselves by accepting arms. That will be a much better life. When Damayanti and Chandidas thought of the behavior of their sons and daughters-in-law, they said again and again, it would be better for us to die than to return home. In the end, they stayed for a few days at the home of a Vaishnava in the village of Ambika, after which they went to see Shantipur and finally arrived at Sri Navadweep Dam. They stayed in Sri Mayapur for a few days with a merchant relative and began to tour the seven localities of Navadweep on the bank of the Ganga, as well as the seven localities of Kuliagram on the other side of the river. After a few days, however, their attachment for their sons and daughters-in-law resurfaced. Chandidas said to his wife, Come, let us return home to Saptagram. After all, they are our sons, aren't they? Won't they show us even a little affection? Their Vaishnavi attendant said emphatically, Have you no dignity? This time they will kill you. When the old couple heard this, they saw the truth in her words and became apprehensive. O oh, respected Vaishnavi, they said, you may return to your own place. We have enough discrimination now. We will maintain our existence by begging, approach a qualified person for instruction, and engage in Bhagavat Bhajan. The Vaishnavi attendant left, and the merchant couple, having now given up all hope of returning to their former home in Saptagram, began to build a new home in the area of Kulyagram. Taking contributions and instructions from many gracious and well-mannered people, they built a cottage and began to live there permanently. Kuliagram is known as the holy place where offenses are eradicated, and the long-standing belief was that all of one's previous offenses would be dispelled if one lived there. One day Chandidas said, O oh mother of Hari, don't speak about our children any more. Don't even think of them. We took birth in a merchant family because of many previous offenses, and due to our defective birth we became misers and never rendered any service to guests or to Vaishnavas. Now if we obtain any wealth here, we will certainly use it to serve guests, so that we may attain auspiciousness in our next life. I have been thinking about opening a grocery shop. I will beg some rupees from a few gentlemen and begin this work. Within a short time, Chandidas opened a small store and managed to make some profit every day. The couple began to serve one guest daily in addition to feeding themselves, and thus their life passed much more pleasantly than before. Chandidas had previously been educated, and now he sat in his shop and read Gunaraj Khan's Sri Krishna Vijay whenever he found time. He ran his shop honestly and served guests hospitably. Five or six months passed in this manner, and when the people of Kulia came to know of Chandidas's previous history, they began to develop faith in him. In this village lived a Grihasta Brahmana named Yadavadas, who lectured every day on Sri Chaitanya Mangal. Chandidas occasionally went to hear those lectures, and when he and Damayanti saw that Yadavadas and his wife were always engaged in serving the Vaishnavas, they also became inspired to do the same. One day, Chandidas inquired from Yadavadas, What is this material existence? Yadavadas said, Many learned Vaishnavas live on the eastern bank of the Bhagirati in Sri Godrumdvip. Come, let us go there and inquire from them. I also go there from time to time and receive many instructions. At present, the Vaishnava scholars of Sri Godrum are more expert than the Brahmana scholars in the conclusions of the Shastras. Some days ago, Sri Vaishnav Das Babaji defeated the Brahmana Pandits of the area in a debate. A deep question like yours can be resolved most satisfactorily there. Yadavadas and Chandidas prepared to cross the Ganga in the afternoon. Damayanti now regularly served pure Vaishnavas, and the miserliness in her heart had disappeared altogether. I will go with you to Sri Godrum, she said. The Vaishnavas there are not Grihastas, said Yadavadas. They have adopted a life of strict renunciation and are detached from all relations with women. I am afraid that they will be unhappy if you come along with us. Damayanti replied, I will offer Dandavat Pranam to them from a distance, and I will not enter their grove. 
I am an old lady. They will never become angry with me. Yadavada said, It is not the custom for ladies to go there. Anyway, we can take you there to sit in a nearby place, and we will bring you back with us when we return. The three of them crossed the Ganga and walked along the sand beside the river, reaching Pradumna Kunja by late afternoon. Damayanti offered prostrated Dandava Pranam at the door of the Kunja and sat nearby under an old banyan tree. Yadavadas and Chandidas entered the Kunja and with great devotion offered Dandava Pranam to the assembly of Vaishnavas who were seated in the Malati Madhavi Bhava. Paramahamsa Babaji was seated in the midst of the assembly surrounded by Sri Vaishnavdas, Lahiri Mahashai, Anantadas Babaji and many others. Chandidas sat close to Yadavadas. Anantadas Babaji looked at Yadavadas and asked, Who is this new man? Yadavadas narrated the whole story of Chandidas. Anantadas Babaji smiled and said, Yes, this is what is known as material existence. One who knows material existence is actually wise, and those who fall into the cycle of material existence are pitiable. Chandidas's mind was gradually becoming cleansed, for when one performs Nitya Sukriti, such as hosting Vaishnavas and reading and hearing Vaishnava Shastras, he certainly attains auspiciousness and very easily develops Shraddha in Ananya Bhakti, exclusive devotion. When he heard Sri Anantadas Babaji's words, Chandidas said with a softened heart, My humble prayer is that you will be merciful to me and clearly explain what is this material existence. Anantadas Babaji said, Your question is very deep, and I desire that Sri Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai or Sri Vaishnavdas Babaji Mahashai should answer it. Paramahamsa Babaji said, Sri Anantadas Babaji Mahashai is perfectly qualified to answer a question of such gravity. Today we will all listen to his instructions. Anantadas, when I receive your order, I must certainly say whatever I know. I shall begin by remembering the lotus feet of my Gurudev, Sri Pradumna Brahmachari, a confidential associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The jivas exist in two states, the liberated state, Mukta Dasha, and the state of material bondage, Samsara Bada Dasha. Liberated jivas include the pure devotees of Sri Krishna, who by Krishna's mercy have never been bound by Maya as well as jivas who have been liberated from material existence. The liberated state of existence is known as mukta dasha. The Buddha jivas, on the other hand, are those who are oblivious to Sri Krishna and have fallen into the clutches of Maya since time without beginning. Their conditioned state of existence is known as samsara Buddha dasha. The jivas who are liberated from Maya are chin Maya, fully spiritual, and their very life is service to Krishna, Krishna Dasya. They do not reside in this material world, but in one of the pure spiritual worlds such as Golok, Vaikuntha or Vrindavan. There are innumerable jivas who are liberated from Maya. The jivas who are bound by Maya are also innumerable. Due to their defect of alienation from Krishna, Krishna's shadow potency, known as Chaya Shakti or Maya, binds the jiva with its three stranded ropes consisting of the three qualities of material nature, namely sattvagun, goodness, rajagun, passion, and tamagun, ignorance. The conditioned souls appear in a variety of states of existence according to the influence of the various gradations of these gunas, qualities. Just consider the varieties in the jiva's bodies, moods, appearance, natures, living conditions and movements. When the jiva enters material existence, he takes on a new type of egoism. In the pure state of existence, the jiva has the egoism of being a servant of Krishna. But in the conditioned state, many different types of egoism arise, making the living entity think, I am a human being, I am a devata, I am an animal, I am a king, I am a brahmana, I am an outcast, I am diseased, I am hungry, I am dishonored, I am charitable, 
I am a husband, I am a wife, I am a father, I am a son, I am an enemy, I am a friend, I am a scholar, I am handsome, I am wealthy, I am poor, I am happy, I am sad, I am strong, and I am weak. These attitudes are known as a hunter, which literally means the sense of I-ness, or false egoism. Besides this a hunter, another function known as mamata, possessiveness, or a sense of minus, enters the nature of the jiva. This is exemplified in attitudes such as, This is my house, these are my possessions, this is my wealth, this is my body, these are my children, this is my wife, this is my husband, this is my father, this is my mother, this is my caste, this is my race. This is my strength, this is my beauty, this is my quality, this is my learning, this is my renunciation, this is my knowledge, this is my wisdom, this is my work, this is my property, and these are my servants and dependents. The colossal affair that brings the conceptions of I and mine into play is known as samsara, material existence. Yadavadas The conceptions of I and mine are active in the conditioned state, but do they also exist in the liberated state? Anantadas, they do, but in the liberated state they are spiritual and free from all defect. In the liberated state in the spiritual world, the jiva becomes acquainted with his pure nature, exactly as it was created by Bhagavan. In that spiritual abode, there are many different types of real egoism, each with its own characteristic sense of I, so there are also many types of chidras, transcendental exchanges of sentiments. All the different chinmaya upakarnas, spiritual paraphernalia, which form the constitutional ingredients of rasa, come under the heading of mine. Yadavadas. Then what is the defect in the different conceptions of I and mine that exist in the conditioned state? Anantadas. The defect is that in the pure state, the conceptions of I and mine are real, whereas in material existence they are all imaginary or imposed upon the living entity. That means that these conceptions are not actually aspects of the jiva, but are all false identities and relationships. Consequently, all varieties of material identification in mundane existence are impermanent and unreal, and only cause momentary happiness and distress. Yadavadas, is this deceptive material existence false? Anantadas, no. This deceptive world is not false. It is a reality by Krishna's will. It is the jiva's conception of I and mine when he enters the material world that is false. Those who believe that this world is false are mayavadis, advocates of the theory of illusion. Such people are offenders. Yadavadas, why have we fallen into this illusory relationship? Anantadas, Bhagavan is the complete spiritual entity, Purna Chit Vastu, and the jivas are particles of spirit, Chit Kana. The jivas' first location is on the boundary line between the material and spiritual worlds. The jivas, who do not forget their relationship with Krishna, are empowered with Chit Shakti and are drawn from that position into the spiritual realm, where they become eternal associates of Sri Hari and begin to relish the transcendental bliss of service to Krishna. Those jivas who turn away from Krishna desire to enjoy Maya, and Maya attracts them towards her by her potency. At precisely that point, their material state of existence comes into being, and their true spiritual identity disappears. I am the enjoyer of Maya. This false egoism covers them with many varieties of false identity. Yadavadas Why is it that our true identity doesn't appear, even though we try to attain it? Anantadas There are two types of endeavor, appropriate and inappropriate. Appropriate endeavors will certainly dissipate false egoism, but how can inappropriate endeavors do so? Yadavadas what are inappropriate endeavors? Anantadas Some people think that their hearts will be purified if they follow Karmakanda, 
and that they will be liberated from maya when they practice brahmagyan. This type of endeavor is inappropriate. Others think that by practicing astanga yoga, they will enter a trance of samadhi yoga and attain perfection. This is another inappropriate endeavor. There are many other types as well. Yadavadas, why are these endeavors inappropriate? Anantadas, these methods are unsuitable because practicing them creates many obstacles to attaining one's desired goal. In addition, there is only a meager possibility of attaining that goal. The point is that our material existence has come about because of an offense. And unless we obtain the mercy of the person whom we offended, we will not gain release from our material condition and attain our pure spiritual condition. Yadavadas, what are appropriate endeavors? Anantadas, Sadhu Sangha, association of devotees, and Prapati, surrender, are proper means. We find the following statement about Sadhu Sangha in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.2.30. Ata atyan tikam she mam, prichamo bhavatonaga, sam sareshmin kshanardo pi, satsangar seva dirninam. O sinless one, we are inquiring from you about the supreme benefit. In this material world, even half a moment's association with a Shuddha Bhakta is the greatest wealth for human beings. If one asks how jivas who have fallen into this material existence can attain their supreme benefit, I will reply that it can be obtained by having satsanga, even for half a moment. Prapati is described in Gita 7.14 as follows. Daivi hyesha guna mayi, mama maya duratyaya, mam eva ye prapadyante, mayam etam tarantite. This divine potency of mine, known as Daivi Maya, consists of the three modes of nature, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Human beings cannot cross over this Maya by their own efforts, and therefore it is very difficult to overcome. Only those who surrender unto me can cross beyond this potency of mine. Chandidas, O great soul, I cannot understand your explanation very well. I have understood that we are pure entities, and that due to our forgetfulness of Krishna, we have fallen into the hands of Maya and are bound in this world. If we obtain Krishna's mercy, we can be delivered again, otherwise we will remain in the same condition. Anantadas, yes, for now it is sufficient for you to believe this much. Yadavadas Mahashai clearly understands all these truths and you should try to understand these things gradually from him. Sri Jagadananda has written a beautiful description of the variegated conditions of the jivas in his book, Sri Prema Vivarta, 6, 1-13. Chitkana jiva krishna chinmaya bhaskar Nitya krishne deki krishne karena adar Krishna bahir mukhahana boga vanchakare Nikatashta maya tare japiti yadare, pisachipa ile jena mati chana hai, maya grasta jivare hai se bava udai, ami seda krishna dasa e kata bule, maya rana parahana chira dine bule, kabu raja kabu praja kabu viprasudra, Kabu duki, kabu shuki, kabu kitak shudra, kabu swarge, kabu martye, narake va kabu, kabu deva, kabu daichya, kabu dash prabhu, e rupe samsara brahmite kona jan, sadhu sangha nija tattva avagatahan, nija tattva jani ara samsara nachai, Kena va bajinu maya kare haya hai. Kande bole ohe krishna amitava das. Tomara charana chari hoila sarvanash. Kripa kari krishna tare chadana samsar. Kakuti kariya krishne dake ekabar. Maya ke pichane raki krishna pane chai. 
Bajite Bajite Krishna Pada Padma Pai Krishna Tare Dena Nija Chikchak Tirabal Maya Akasana Chade Haya Durbal Sadhu Sangha Krishna Nam E Matra Chai Sangsara Jinite Ara Kona Vastunai The Jiva is an infinitesimal particle of spiritual consciousness like an atomic particle of light emanating from the sun. Sri Krishna is the complete spiritual consciousness, the transcendental sun. As long as jivas focus their attention on Krishna, they maintain reverence for him. However, when they turn their attention away from Krishna, they desire material enjoyment. Krishna's deluding potency, Maya, who is standing near them, then binds them in her embrace. Footnote by Śrīla Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj There are two types of entities, Chaitanya, animate, and Jada, inanimate. Animate entities are those who have desire and the power to experience, and inanimate entities are those that do not. There are also two types of animate entities, those who possess full consciousness, Purna Chaitanya, and those who possess minute consciousness, Shudra Chaitanya. Bhagavan possesses full consciousness, and in his original feature, he is Krishna. This is declared in Srimad Bhagavatam 1.3.28 by the statement, Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam. Krishna is the original Bhagavan. The jivas possess minute consciousness. They are his separated parts, known as Vibhinamsha Tattva, and they are innumerable. The Shastras have compared the mutual relationship between Sri Krishna and the jivas to the relationship that exists between the sun and the infinitesimal glittering particles of light present in the sun's rays. Bhagavan Sri Krishna is the spiritual sun and the jivas are infinitesimal particles of spirit. The dharma or svabhav of the infinitesimal jivas is to serve Krishna. When the jivas are formed, their dharma is born simultaneously. Just as in fire, the power to burn is always present. As the existence of fire cannot be accepted without burning power, the essence of the individual soul's identity as a jiva is not established without service to Krishna. A vastu, substance, cannot exist independently of its dharma, natural characteristic function, and neither can a function exist independently of its substance. Nonetheless, a substance and its function can become perverted. The inherent function of the jiva is certainly to serve Krishna, but when the jiva is indifferent to Krishna and covets different types of sensual enjoyment, Bhagavan's external potency, Bahiranga Shakti or Maya, which is situated nearby, seizes him and binds him in her web. End footnote. The Dharma of the jiva who has turned away from Krishna, becomes covered, just as a person's intelligence becomes covered when he is haunted by a witch. He forgets Sri Hari's identity and his own identity as a servant of Hari. Becoming a slave of Maya, he wanders here and there for a long time in this illusory material existence. Sometimes he is a king, and sometimes a subject, sometimes a brahmana, and sometimes a shudra. Sometimes he is happy, and sometimes distressed, and sometimes he is a tiny insect. Sometimes he is in heaven, sometimes on earth, and sometimes in hell. Sometimes he is a deva, and sometimes a demon. Sometimes he is a servant, and sometimes a master. As he is wandering like this throughout material existence, if by some great fortune he happens to obtain the association of pure devotees, he comes to know of his own identity, and his life thus becomes meaningful. By his association with those bhaktas, he understands his true identity, and becomes indifferent to material enjoyment. Grieving bitterly for his predicament, he laments, Alas, alas, why did I serve Maya for so long? He cries profusely, and prays at the lotus feet of Sri Hari, O Krishna, I am your eternal servant, but I have been ruined because I disregarded the service of your feet. 
Who knows how long I have been wandering aimlessly as the slave of Maya? O oh, Patita Pavana, O oh, Dinanath, please protect this destitute soul. Deliver me from your Maya and engage me in your service. Shri Krishna is an ocean of mercy, and when he hears the jiva cry out in such desperation even once, he quickly transports him across this insurmountable material energy. Krishna empowers the jiva with his chit shakti, so that Maya's power to attract the soul gradually wanes. The jiva then turns his back on Maya and desires to attain Krishna. He worships Krishna again and again and finally becomes competent to attain his lotus feet. Therefore, the only infallible method to cross this insurmountable material existence is to chant Krishna Nam in the association of bhaktas. Yadavadas, Babaji Mahashai, the sadhus of whom you are speaking are also present in this world, and they are also oppressed by the miseries of material existence, so how can they deliver other jivas? Anantadas, it is a fact that sadhus also live in this world, but there is a significant difference between the earthly life of a sadhu and that of the jivas who are bewildered by maya. Although the earthly lives of both appear to be the same from the outside, internally there is a vast difference. Moreover, the association of sadhus is very rare, because even though sadhus are always present, the common man cannot recognize them. There are two categories of jivas who have fallen into the clutches of maya. Some are completely absorbed in insignificant worldly pleasures and have tremendous regard for this material world whereas others are dissatisfied with the insignificant pleasures of Maya and employ finer discrimination in the hope of attaining a superior quality of happiness. Consequently, the people of this world may be roughly divided into two groups, those who lack the power to distinguish between spirit and matter and those who possess such spiritual insight. Some people refer to those who have no such insight as material sense enjoyers and to those who have insight as mamukshas, those who seek liberation. When I use the word mamukshu here, I am not referring to those who seek the nirvishesh brahman through the process of monistic knowledge. Mamukshus in the Vedic sense are those who are exasperated with the miseries of material existence and seek their true spiritual identity. The word mamuksha literally means the desire for mukti, liberation. When a mamukshu gives up this desire for liberation and engages in worshipping Sri Hari, his bhajan is known as Shuddha Bhakti. The Shastras do not order one to give up mukti, rather when a person who desires liberation gains knowledge of the truth of Krishna and the jivas, he is liberated at once. This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam 6.14.3-5 as follows. Rajo bi samasankhyata parti ver i hajantava te sham ye ke chane hante shreyo vai manujadaya. The jivas of this world are as innumerable as particles of dust. Among all these living entities, very few attain higher life forms, such as those of the human beings, devas, and gandharvas, and very few of those adopt higher religious principles. Prayo mumukshavas te sham, ke chanaiva dvijotama, mumukshu nang sahasreshu, kaschin muche tasidyati. O best of the Brahmanas, amongst those who adopt higher religious principles, very few strive for liberation, and out of many thousands who strive for liberation, one may actually attain the perfected or liberated state. Muktanam abhisedanam. Narayana Parayana Sudurlaba Prashantatma Kotishvapi Mahamune O great sage, among many millions of such liberated and perfected souls, a devotee who is fully peaceful and exclusively devoted to Sri Narayan is extremely rare. Bhaktas of Krishna are even more rare than those of Narayan, for they have surpassed the desire for liberation and are already situated in the liberated state. They remain in this world as long as the body endures, but their earthly existence is categorically different 
from that of the materialists. The bhaktas of Krishna live in this world in two conditions, as householders or as renunciants. Yadavadas The Bhagavatam shlokas which you just quoted refer to four categories of people who possess spiritual insight. Out of these four, which type of association is considered sadhu sangha? Anantadas There are four categories of people who possess spiritual insight. Viveki, those who are conscientious. Mumuksu, those who desire liberation. Mukta, those who are liberated. And the Bhakta. Amongst these, the association of Vivekis and Mumuksus is beneficial for Vishayis, gross materialists. Muktas are either liberated individuals with an insatiable thirst for Chidrasa or impersonalists who pride themselves on being liberated. Only association with the first type of Muktas is beneficial. Nirbade Mayavadis are offenders. An association with them is forbidden for all. Such people have been condemned in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.2.32. Ye nye ravindaksha vi mukta maninas, tvayasta bhava da vishuda budaya, aruya krichtrena param padam tata, patantya do nadrita, yusmad angraya. O lotus eyed Lord, those who do not take shelter of your lotus feet, vainly consider themselves to be liberated. Their intelligence is impure because they are devoid of affection and devotion for you, and in reality they are Bada Jivas. Even though such people attain the platform of liberation by undergoing severe austerities and spiritual practices, they fall from that position due to neglecting your lotus feet. The fourth category of discriminating souls, the Bhaktas, are attracted either to Sri Hari's opulent and majestic feature, Aishwarya, or to his sweet and intimate feature, Madhurya. The association of Sri Hari's bhaktas is beneficial in all respects, particularly if one takes shelter of those bhaktas who are immersed in Sri Hari's sweetness, the transcendental mellows of bhakti, Vishuddha Bhakti Ras, will manifest in one's heart. Yadavadas you have explained that bhaktas live in two conditions. Kindly explain this clearly so that people like myself who have limited intelligence may understand easily. Anantadas Bhaktas are either grihasta bhaktas, householders, or tyagi bhaktas, those who have renounced household life. Yadavadas Please describe the nature of the grihasta bhaktas' relationship with this world. Anantadas, one does not become a grihasta simply by building a house and living in it. The word griha in grihasta refers to the household that one establishes by accepting a suitable wife in marriage according to Vedic rules and regulations. A bhakta who resides in such a condition and practices bhakti is known as a grihasta bhakta. The jiva who is bound by maya sees form and color through the eyes. He hears sound through the ears, he smells fragrance through the nose, he touches with the skin, and he tastes with the tongue. The jiva enters the material world through these five senses and becomes attached to it. The more attached he is to gross matter, the more distant he is from his prananath, the lord of his life, Sri Krishna, and his condition is called Bahi Muksamsara, consciousness directed outward toward mundane existence. Those who are intoxicated with this mundane existence are known as vishais, those who are attached to worldly sense objects. When bhaktas live as grihastas, they are not like the vishais who merely seek to gratify their senses. A householder's dharma patni, wife, who is one's partner in realizing nitya dharma, is a maidservant of Krishna, dasi, and so are his sons and daughters. The eyes of all the family members are satisfied to behold the form of the deity and objects related to Krishna. Their ears become fully satisfied to hear Harikata and narrations of the lives of great sadhus. Their noses experience satisfaction by smelling the aroma of Tulsi and the other fragrant objects offered to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Their tongues taste the nectar of Krishna Nam and the remnants of food offered to Krishna. 
Their skin feels delight through touching the limbs of Sri Hari's bhaktas. Their hopes, activities, desires, hospitality to guests, and service to the deity are all subordinate to their service to Krishna. Indeed, their entire life is a great festival consisting of Krishna Nam, mercy to Jivas, and service to Vaishnavas. Only Grihastha Bhaktas can possess material objects and utilize them without becoming attached to them. It is most appropriate for Jivas in the age of Kali to become Grihastha Vaishnavas, for then there is no fear of falling down. Footnote by Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has stated that in the age of Kali it is recommended that all jivas become Grihastha Vaishnavas, for in this there is no fear of falling down. The meaning of this statement is that it is the duty of all human beings to live in an unfallen condition and engage in the service of Vishnu and Vaishnavas. However, it is not the intention of the author to instruct that everyone must be a Grihastha, or that in the age of Kali no one should accept any ashram other than the Grihastha ashram. Those who are heavily influenced by the material qualities of passion and ignorance, who are excessively attached to material sense enjoyment, and who have a strong inclination towards the path of fruitive action, pravriti marg, are recommended to accept marriage and follow the Grihastha dharma in order to counteract these tendencies. On the other hand, those whose nature is of the quality of goodness and purity, and who follow the path of detachment, nivriti marg, should not marry, and thus become fallen. In the Vishnu Purana 3.8.9, we find the following statement regarding ashram. Vanashrama chara vata, purushena para puman, Vishnu aradhyate panta, nanyatato shakaranam. Sri Vishnu is worshipped only by carrying out one's prescribed duties in Vanashram. There is no other way to please him. In this shloka, the word ashram refers not only to the Grihastha ashram, but to all four ashrams. In Srimad Bhagavatam 11.17.14, there is the following statement regarding ashram. Grihashramo jangana to Brahmacharyam Hridomama, Vakshastalad Vanevasha, Sanyasa Sirasistita. The Grihasta Ashram has sprung from the thighs of my universal form, the Brahmachari Ashram from my heart, the Vanaprasta Ashram from my chest, and the Sanyas Ashram from my head. These are the four ashrams described in the Shastra. One of the characteristics of a Vaishnava is engaging in the worship of Sri Vishnu while remaining in the ashram for which he is eligible. At present, there is no shortage of examples of this. In this very book, the characters Prem Das, Vaishnav Das, Ananta Das, and many other qualified instructors are sannyasis, brahmacharis, or grihatyagis. Another point is that not all the followers of the author, Sri Bhaktivinoda Thakur, are Grihastha Bhaktas. Some of them are Brahmacharis, and some have given up household life and are situated in the highest order sannyas and are thus fit to instruct the world. In the third chapter, sannyas is referred to as the topmost ashram. This same conclusion is expressed in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.17.15, the crest jewel of all Shastras. Varnanam ashramanam cha Janma bumya nusharina, asan prakrit tayo nirnam, nichir nicho tamotamaha. The varnas and ashrams of humanity are possessed of higher and lower natures in accordance with the higher and lower places on Sri Bhagavan's universal body from which they appeared. The conclusion of this statement is that sannyas is the highest of the four ashrams, and grihasta is the lowest. The Brahmachari ashram is situated above the Grihastha ashram, and the Vanaprastha ashram is situated above the Brahmachari ashram. These ashrams are related to the acquired tendency arising from one's temporary nature. Like Varnas, ashrams are also divided according to nature, tendency, and work. 
men of lower nature who are inclined to engage in fruitive action are compelled to become grihastas. Naishtika brahmacharis, those who adopt a lifelong vow of celibacy, are the wealth of Sri Krishna's heart. Vanaprastha renunciants have appeared from Krishna's chest, and sannyasis, who are the reservoirs of auspicious qualities, have arisen from his head. The brahmacharis, vanaprastas and sannyasis are therefore all superior to the grihastas, but one remains ineligible to enter into these three superior ashrams as long as a taste for the path of renunciation is not awakened in the heart. In the Manu Samhita 5.56 it is said, Na mangsa bakshane doshe, na madye na chamaitune, pravritir eshabhutanam, nivritistu mahapala. Human beings are naturally inclined to the pleasures of meat-eating, intoxication and sexual indulgence, but abstinence from such activities yields highly beneficial results. This is corroborated in the Srimad Bhagavatam 11.5.11 Loke virvaya mishamadya seva nitya hijantur nahitatra chodana vyavashtitis teshu vivaha yagya suragrahe ashu nivritir ishta In this world it is observed that people have a natural tendency towards sexual enjoyment meat-eating and intoxication. Shastra cannot sanction engagement in such activities, but special provisions have been given whereby some association with the opposite sex is permitted through marriage. Some eating of flesh is permitted through performance of sacrifice, and the drinking of wine is permitted in the ritual known as Sotramani Yagya. The purpose of such injunctions is to restrain the licentious tendencies of the general populace and to establish them in moral conduct. The intrinsic purpose of the Vedas in making such provisions is to draw people away from such activities altogether. In many other Shastras, the superiority of the path of renunciation has been delineated. At the end of the tenth chapter of this book, Sri Bhaktivinoda Thakur has cited the above-mentioned Bhagavatam Shloka and drawn the following conclusion. It is not the purpose of Shastra to encourage the killing of animals. The Vedas state, Mahim syat sarvani bhutani. Do not harm any living entity. This statement forbids violence to animals. However, as long as a person's nature is strongly influenced by passion and ignorance, he will have a natural inclination towards sexual enjoyment, meat-eating and intoxication. Such a person does not await the sanction of the Vedas to engage in such activities. The intent of the Vedas is to provide a means whereby human beings who have not adopted the quality of goodness and thus renounced the tendencies for violence, sexual enjoyment and intoxication can curb such tendencies and satisfy these demands through the agency of religion. People who are conducted by these lower tendencies may associate with the opposite sex through religious marriage. They may kill animals only through certain prescribed methods of sacrifice, and they may take intoxication only on certain occasions and by following certain procedures. By following these methods, their tendency towards these activities will wane, and they will gradually give them up. Therefore, the Grihastha Ashram is necessary in Kali Yuga in order to draw people away from the path of fruitive action and towards the path of renunciation. It was never the intention of the author to suggest that those who are eligible for the highest order of life should become Grihastas. Later in this same chapter, Sri Bhaktivinoda Thakur has expressed the purpose of marriage in the following words. One should not enter marriage for the purpose of begetting children or to worship the forefathers. Rather, one should think, I accept this maidservant of Krishna, so that we may be able to assist each other in the service of Krishna. This attitude is favorable to bhakti. Consequently, those who marry without a desire for children can actually be true Grihastha Vaishnavas. When a man truly regards his wife as a maidservant of Krishna, there is no scope for regarding her as an object of his own pleasure. Instead, his mood will be one of adoration. 
It is a fact that there are statements that sanction the desire for children, such as putra te kriyate bariya. A wife is accepted for the purpose of having children, but the implication here is that one should desire to beget servants of Krishna and not ordinary mundane children. The word putra, son, is derived from the word put, which refers to a particular hellish planet, and tra is derived from the verbal root meaning to deliver. Thus the traditional significance of the word putra is to beget a son who can deliver one from hell by offering oblations after one's demise. However, there is no possibility that Vaishnavas, who regularly chant Sri Harinam, will go to the hell known as Put. Therefore they do not desire Putras, but servants of Krishna. Generally, a man who is bound by material conditioning and who pursues the path of fruitive action indulges in sexual intercourse with a woman in order to satisfy his lusty propensities. Children are born only as a by-product of that desire. This is the reason why people these days are generally of a lustful nature. As it is commonly said, Atmavat Jayate Putra, a son takes after his father. Although the Grihasta Ashram is the lowest of the four ashrams, Srila Bhakti Vinotako has recommended it with a desire to benefit everyone in the world. His recommendation is especially directed towards people whose mentality is similar to that of Chandidas and Damayanti. Actually, great souls who naturally follow the path of detachment by the influence of the Sukriti they have acquired in previous lives will never become entangled in domestic life by accepting marriage. Such elevated people still have the opportunity to fall. But where is the question of falling for people who are already fallen? If a Naishtika Brahmachari or a Sannyasi were to misunderstand the underlying meaning of the above-mentioned instruction, and on the basis of those words were to give up their brahmacharya or sannyas and in contravention to shastra marry one of their disciples, a god sister or some other woman or were to advise another brahmachari or sannyasi to do so, then such a pitiable, base and atheistic person would indeed be rare in the history of the world. A second point is that it is highly disgraceful for unqualified people to adopt the dress of brahmacharis, tyagis or sannyasis, to imitate their behavior and to consider themselves equal to great personalities situated in those ashrams. Such people are like Sri Galavasudev, the jackal who impersonated Sri Krishna and whose narration has been described in Srimad Bhagavatam, Harivamsha, Chaitanya Bhagavat and other shastras. People who are situated in a lower stage and who are attached to the path of fruitive action should first curb the deplorable tendency towards lust by becoming lawfully married according to religious principles. The purpose of the Shastra is to guide all living beings toward the path of detachment. The Brahma Vaivarta Purana, Krishna Kanda, 112 through 113 states, Ashvamedam Gavalam Bam, Sanyasam Palapaitrikam, Devarena Satot Patim, Kalo Pancha Vivarjayat. In Kali Yuga, five activities are forbidden the offering of a horse in sacrifice, the offering of a cow in sacrifice, the acceptance of sannyas, offering flesh to the forefathers, and begetting children through a husband's brother. Some people try to establish, on the basis of this shloka, that the acceptance of sannyas is forbidden in Kali Yuga. However, this shloka has a hidden intention. The purpose of this shloka is not to forbid sannyas altogether. Indeed, many great personalities who appeared in Kali Yuga were tyagis or sannyasis, including Sri Ramanuja, Sri Madhva, Sri Vishnu Swami and other acharyas who were all well acquainted with all the shastras, as well as the crown jewel of all acharyas, the six Goswamis, who are bhaktas of Sri Gora. The pure succession of sannyas is continuing even today. The injunction against accepting sannyas in Kali Yuga actually means that it is improper to accept the Ekadanda sannyas that evolved from the unauthorized line of thought propagated by Acharya Shankara, expressed in the maxims such as Soham, 
I am that Brahman, and Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. It is this type of sannyas that has been forbidden. Tridanda sannyas is the real perpetual sannyas, and it is applicable at all times. Sometimes Tridanda sannyas externally appears in the form of Ekadanda sannyas. Ekadanda sannyasis of this type, who are actually great souls, accept the eternality of Tridanda sannyas that symbolizes the three features of Savya, the object of service, Sevaka, the servitor, and Seva, service. Such people consider the Ekadanda sannyas propagated by Shankara to be completely unauthorized and not supported by Shastra. It is therefore proven, even on the basis of the Brahma Vaivarta Purana Shloka, cited by Smarta Acharyas, that it is logical for sadhaks who are pursuing the Nivriti Marg to accept sannyas. End of footnote. Anantadas continues to describe the nature of the Grihasta Bhaktas relationship with this material world. Only Grihasta Bhaktas can possess material objects and utilize them without becoming attached to them. It is most appropriate for jivas in the age of Kali to become Grihasta Vaishnavas, for then there is no fear of falling down. Bhakti can also be developed fully from this position. Many Grihasta Vaishnavas are gurus who are well versed in the fundamental truths of the Shastra. If the children of such saintly Vaishnavas are pure Vaishnavas, Goswamis, they too are counted as Grihasta Bhaktas. This is why the association of Grihasta Bhaktas is particularly beneficial for the Jivas. Yadavadas Grihasta Vaishnavas are obliged to remain under the jurisdiction of Smarta Brahmanas, otherwise they will have to suffer much harassment in society. Under such circumstances, how can they practice Shuddha Bhakti? Anantadas Grihasta Vaishnavas are certainly obliged to carry out social conventions, such as getting their sons and daughters married, performing ceremonial functions for deceased forefathers and other similar responsibilities. However, they should not engage in ritualistic activities meant only to fulfill material ambitions, kamya karma. When it comes to maintaining one's livelihood, everyone, even one who calls himself Nirpeksha, devoid of all needs, depends upon other people or things. All embodied beings have needs. They depend on medicine when they become ill, on foodstuffs when they are hungry, on clothing to dispel the cold, and on a house for protection from excessive heat or rain. Nirapeksha really means to reduce one's necessities as far as possible, for no one can be absolutely independent as long as he has a material body. Still, it is best to be as free as possible from material dependency, for that is more conducive to advancement in bhakti. All the activities that I mentioned before become free from defect only when one links them with Krishna. For example, one should not enter marriage with a desire to beget children or to worship the forefathers and prajapatis. It is favorable to bhakti to think, I am only accepting this maidservant of Krishna so that we can assist each other in Krishna's service and establish Krishna-centered family life together. Whatever one's materially attached relatives or family priests may say, ultimately one reaps the fruit of one's own determination. On the occasion of the Shraddha ceremony, one should first offer the forefathers the remnants of food that has been offered to Sri Krishna, and then feed the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. If Grihasta Vaishnavas observe the Shraddha ceremony in this way, it is favorable for their bhakti. All the smarta rituals are karma, unless and until one combines them with bhakti. Karma that is enjoined in the Vedas is not unfavorable to bhakti, so long as one performs it during one's practice of Shuddha Bhakti. One should perform ordinary activities in a renounced spirit and without attachment for the result, and one should perform spiritual activities in the association of bhaktas. Then there will be no fault. Consider for a moment that most of Sriman Mahaprabhu's associates were Grihasta Bhaktas, and so were many Rajarshis, saintly kings, and Devarshis, great sages from ancient times, 
Druva, Prahlad and the Pandavas were all Grihastabhaktas. You should know that Grihastabhaktas are also highly respected in the world. Yadavadas If Grihastabhaktas are so highly respected and dear to everyone, why do some of them renounce household life? Anantadas Some Grihastabhaktas are eligible to renounce their household life, but such Vaishnavas are very few in this world, and their association is rare. Yadavadas Kindly explain how one becomes eligible to renounce household life. Anantadas Human beings have two tendencies, Bahirmuk, the outward tendency, and Antarmuk, the inward tendency. The Vedas refer to these two tendencies as being focused outwards towards the external world and focused inwards towards the soul. When the pure spiritual soul forgets his true identity, he falsely identifies the mind as the self, although the mind is really only a part of the subtle material body. Having identified with the mind in this way, the soul takes assistance from the doorways of the senses and becomes attracted to the external sense objects. This is the outward tendency. The inward tendency is exhibited when the stream of consciousness reverts from gross matter back into the mind and from there to the soul proper. One whose tendency is predominantly outward must conduct all external tendencies offenselessly with Krishna at the center through the strength of Sadhu Sangha. If one takes shelter of Krishna Bhakti, these outward tendencies are quickly curtailed and converted to the inward tendency. When the direction of one's tendency is completely inward, the eligibility to renounce household life is born. But if one gives up household life before this stage is reached, there is a significant danger of falling down again. The Grihasta Ashram is a special school where the jivas learn about spiritual truth, Atmatattva, and get a chance to develop spiritual realizations. They may leave the school when their education is complete. Yadavadas What are the symptoms of a bhakta who is eligible to give up household life? Anantadas He should be free from the desire to associate with the opposite sex for gross or subtle material enjoyment. He should have unrestricted mercy toward all living entities. He should be completely indifferent towards endeavors to accumulate wealth, and he should strive only in times of need to acquire food and clothing suitable for maintaining himself. He should have unconditional love for Sri Krishna, should shun the association of materialists, should be free from the desire to perform great undertakings, and should be free from attachment and aversion in life and death. Srimad Bhagavatam 11.2.45 describes these symptoms as follows. Sarva Bhuteshu Ya Pasyed Bhagavad Bhavam Atmanaha Bhutani Bhagavat Yatmani Esha Bhagavatotamaha One who sees his own mood of attraction for Sri Krishna Chandra, the soul of all souls, in all jivas, and who also sees all living entities residing within the shelter of Sri Krishna, is an Uttam Bhagavat. In Srimad Bhagavatam 3.25.22, Bhagavan Kapiladev describes the primary characteristics of sadhus. Mayan anyena bhavena bhaktim kurvanti ye dritam matkrite tyakta karmanas tyakta svajana bandavaha those who worship no one but me, and who therefore engage in firm and exclusive devotion unto me, give up everything for my sake, including all duties prescribed in Varnashram Dharma, and all relationships with their wives, children, friends and relatives. It is also stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.2.55 Visrijati Hridayam Nayasya Sakshad Darir Avisha Bito Pyagoganasha Pranaya Rasanaya Dritangri Padmaha Sabhavati Bhagavata Pradhan Uktaha If one utters, even without intent, Sri Hari Nam in an offenseless mood, at once heaps of sins accumulated through many lifetimes are destroyed. Such a person thereby binds Sri Hari's lotus feet within his heart with ropes of love 
and is considered the best of bhaktas. When these symptoms are manifest in a grihasta bhakta, he is no longer suited for engagement in karma, and he therefore renounces household life. Such nirpeksha bhaktas, renunciants, are rare, and one should consider himself extremely fortunate to attain their association. Yadavadas These days, young men often renounce household life and adopt the dress of the renounced order. They establish a place for sadhus to congregate and begin to worship the deity of the Lord. After some time, they fall into association with women again, but do not give up chanting Harinam. They maintain their hermitage by collecting alms from many places. Are such men Tiagis or Grihasta Bhaktas? Anantadas, your question raises several issues at once, but I will answer them one by one. First of all, Eligibility to renounce household life has nothing to do with youth or old age. Some Grihasta Bhaktas are qualified by the sanskars acquired in this life and previous lives to give up householder life even while they are young. For example, Shukadev's previous sanskars enabled him to renounce household life from the moment of birth. One should only see that this eligibility is not artificial. If real detachment awakens, then youth is not an impediment. Yadavadas What is real renunciation and what is false renunciation? Anantadas Real renunciation is so firm that it can never be broken at any time. False renunciation arises from deception, dishonesty and the desire for prestige. Some people make a false show of renunciation to gain the respect that is offered to Nirpeksha Bhaktas who have given up household life, but such false detachment is futile and completely inauspicious. As soon as such a person leaves home, the symptoms of his eligibility for detachment disappear and depravity sets in. Yadavadas, does a Bhakta who has given up household life need to adopt the external dress of a renunciant? Anantadas, Nirapeksha Akinchana Bhaktas, who have firmly renounced the spirit of enjoyment, purify the entire world, whether they live in the forest or remain at home. Some of them accept a loincloth and worn and torn clothes as external signs to identify them as members of the renounced order. At the time of accepting this attire, they strengthen their resolve by taking a firm vow in the presence of other Vaishnavas who are in the renounced order. This is called entrance into the renounced order or the acceptance of appropriate garments for renunciation. If you refer to this as the acceptance of the dress of renunciation, Beka Grahana or Vesh Grahana, what is the harm? Yadavadas, what is the purpose of being identified by the signs of the renounced order? Anantadas, it is very helpful to be identified as a member of the renounced order. A renunciant's family members will no longer maintain a relationship with him and will easily give him up. He will no longer desire to enter his house and a natural detachment will awaken in his heart with a consequent fear of materialistic society. It is beneficial for some bhaktas to accept the outward signs of renunciation, though this may not be necessary if detachment from household life is fully matured. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 4.29.46 Sa jahati matim loke vede cha parinishtitam A bhakta who has received the mercy of Bhagavan gives up attachment for all worldly activities and for all ritualistic duties prescribed in the Vedas. There is no injunction for such bhaktas to accept the outward dress of renunciation. It is necessary only as long as there is some dependence on public consideration. Yadavadas From whom should one accept the renounced order? Anantadas One should accept the renounced order from a Vaishnava who is situated in the renounced order. Grihasta Bhaktas have no experience of the behavior of renounced Bhaktas, so they should not initiate anyone into the renounced order. The following statement of the Brahma Vaivarta Purana confirms this. One brings ruination to the world if he instructs others in religious principles 
that he himself does not follow. Yadavadas, what criteria should a guru use to offer initiation into the renounced order? Anantadas, one should see if the Krishna Bhakti of the Grihasta Bhakta has imbued him with a spiritual temperament and with qualities such as full control of the mind and senses. Has the hankering for wealth and the satisfaction of the tongue been uprooted or not? The guru should keep the disciple with him for some time in order to examine him thoroughly, and he may initiate him into the renounced order when he finds that he is a suitable candidate. Under no circumstances should he offer initiation prior to this. If the guru offers initiation to a person who is unqualified, he will certainly fall down himself. Yadavadas, now I see that it is no light matter to accept the renounced order. It is a serious undertaking. Unqualified gurus are turning this practice into a common affair. It has only just begun, and there is no telling where it will end. Anantadas, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu severely punished Chota Haridas for a completely insignificant fault, just to protect the sanctity of the renounced order. The followers of our Lord should always remember the punishment of Chota Haridas. Yadavadas, is it proper to construct a monastery and establish the worship of a deity after one has entered the renounced order? Anantadas, no. A qualified disciple who has entered the renounced order should maintain his existence by begging every day. He should not involve himself in constructing a monastery or in other grand enterprises. He can live anywhere, either in a secluded hut or in the temple of a householder. He should remain aloof from all affairs that require money, and he should constantly chant Sri Hari Nam without offense. Yadavadas, what do you call renunciants who set up a monastery and then live like householders? Anantadas, they may be called Vantasi those who eat their own vomit. Yadavadas, then they are no longer to be considered Vaishnavas? Anantadas, what benefit is there in their association when their behavior is contrary to Shastra and Vaishnava Dharma? They have given up pure bhakti and have adopted a hypocritical lifestyle. What relationship could a Vaishnava have with such people? Yadavadas, how can one say that they have given up Vaishnavism, as long as they don't give up the chanting of Hari Nam. Anantadas, Hari Nam and Nama Parad are two different things. Pure Hari Nam is quite distinct from offensive chanting that only has the external appearance of Hari Nam. It is an offense to commit sins on the strength of chanting Sri Nam. If one chants Sri Nam and at the same time commits sinful activities, Thinking that the power of Sri Nam will exempt him from sinful reactions, he is committing Nama Parad. This is not Shuddha Hari Nam, and one should flee far away from such offensive chanting. Yadavadas, then is the domestic life of such people not to be considered Krishna centered? Anantadas, never. There is no room for hypocrisy in a Krishna centered domestic life. There can only be complete honesty and simplicity, with no trace of offense. Yadavadas, is such a person inferior to a Grihasta Bhakta? Anantadas, he is not even a devotee, so there is no question of comparing him with any Bhakta. Yadavadas, how may he be rectified? Anantadas, he will be counted amongst the Bhaktas again when he gives up all these offenses constantly chants Sri Nam and sheds tears of repentance. Yadavadas Babaji Mahashai Grihasta Bhaktas are situated under the rules and regulations of Varnashram Dharma. If a Grihasta is excluded from Varnashram Dharma, is he not barred from becoming a Vaishnava? Anantadas Ah! Vaishnava Dharma is very liberal. All Jivas have the right to Vaishnava Dharma. That is why it is also known as Jaiva Dharma. Even outcasts can take up Vaishnava Dharma and live as Grihastas, although they are not part of Varnashram. Moreover, people who have accepted sannyas within Varnashram and have fallen from their position may later adopt pure bhakti by the influence of Sadhu Sangha. 
such people can become Grihastha Bhaktas, although they are also outside the jurisdiction of Varnashram regulations. There are others who abandon Varnashram Dharma due to their misdeeds. If they and their children take shelter of Shuddha Bhakti by the influence of Sadhu Sangha, they may become Grihastha Bhaktas, although they are also outside Varnashram. So we see that there are two kinds of Grihastha Bhaktas, one who is part of Varnashram and one who is excluded from Varnashram. Yadavadas, which is superior of these two? Anantadas, whoever has the most bhakti is superior. If neither has any bhakti, then the person who is following Varnashram is superior from the relative Vyavaharic point of view, because at least he has some religious principles, whereas the other is an outcast with no religious principles. However, from the absolute, spiritual, paramartic perspective, both of them have fallen because they have no bhakti. Yadavadas. Does a grihasta have the right to wear the garments of a mendicant while he is still a householder? Anantadas. No. If he does, he is guilty on two counts. He cheats himself and he cheats the world. If a grihasta adopts the dress of a mendicant, he simply affronts and ridicules genuine mendicants who wear the dress of the renounced order. Yadavadas. Babaji Mahashai, do the Shastras describe any system for accepting the renounced order? Anantadas. It is not clearly described. People of all castes can become Vaishnavas, but according to Shastra, only those who are twice born can accept sannyas. In Srimad Bhagavatam 7.11.35, Narada describes the separate characteristics of each of the different Varnas and then concludes with this statement, Yasya ya lakshanam proktam pumso varna bivyanjakam yad anyatrapi drishyeta tat te naiva vinirdrishet. A person should be considered to belong to the varna whose characteristics he possesses, even if he has appeared in a different caste. The principal criterion for determining varna is possession of the characteristics unique to that varna. Birth is not the principal criteria for determining varna. If the symptoms of any particular varna are seen to exist in a person of a different caste, those symptoms determine that person's varna. This verdict of the Shastras supports the practice of offering sannyas to men who possess brahminical symptoms, even though they are born of other castes but it only applies to paramatic affairs and not to Vyavaharic affairs. Yadavadas Brother Chandidas, do you have the answer to your question? Chandidas, today I have been blessed. Of all the instructions that have flowed from the mouth of the most revered Babaji Mahashai, these are the points that I have been able to assimilate. The Jiva is an eternal servant of Krishna, but he forgets this and takes on a material body. Influenced by the qualities of material nature, he derives happiness and distress from material objects. For the privilege of enjoying the fruits of his material activities, he must wear a garland of birth, old age and death. The jiva sometimes takes birth in a high position and sometimes in a low position, and he is led into innumerable circumstances by his repeated change of identity. Hunger and thirst spur him to action in a body that may perish at any instant. He is bereft of the necessities of this world and is cast into unlimited varieties of suffering. Many diseases and ailments appear which torment his body. In his home he quarrels with his wife and children and sometimes he goes to the extent of committing suicide. His greed to accumulate wealth drives him to commit many sins. He is punished by the government insulted by others, and thus he suffers untold bodily afflictions. He is constantly aggrieved by separation from family members, loss of wealth, theft by robbers, and countless other causes of suffering. When a person becomes old, his relatives do not take care of him, and this causes him great distress. His withered body is ravaged by mucus, rheumatism, and a barrage of other pains, and is simply a source of misery. After death, 
he enters another womb and suffers intolerable pain. Yet despite all this, as long as the body remains, his discrimination is overpowered by lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride and envy. This is samsara. I now understand the meaning of the word samsara. I repeatedly offer Dandavat Pranam to Babaji Mahashai. The Vaishnavas are gurus for the entire world. Today, by the mercy of the Vaishnavas, I have acquired real knowledge of this material world. When the Vaishnavas present had heard Anantadas Babaji Mahashai's profound instructions, they all loudly exclaimed, Sadhu, Sadhu! By this time, many Vaishnavas had assembled there, and they began to sing a bhajan that Lahiri Mahashai had composed. The jiva who has fallen into this dreadful material existence finds no end to his distress, but his troubles come to an end when he is graced by the association of sadhus and then takes to the worship of Sri Hari. The raging fire of sensual desires scorches his heart, and when he tries to satisfy those desires, the fire simply flares up with greater intensity. However, relinquishing offences and chanting Sri Krishna Nam acts like a cooling shower of rain, which extinguishes this blazing fire. Kalidas says, He who has taken shelter of the lotus feet of Chaitanya Nittai is my refuge in life and in death. As the kirtan was going on, Chandidas danced in great ecstasy. He took the dust of the feet of the Babajis upon his head and began to roll on the ground, weeping in intense joy. Everyone declared, Chandidas is extremely fortunate. After some time, Yadavadas said, Let us go, Chandidas. We need to go to the other side of the river. Smiling, Chandidas replied cryptically, If you traverse the river of material existence, then by your Sangha I can also cross. The two of them offered Dandavat Pranam to Pradyumna Kunja and departed. As they came out of the Kunja, they saw Damayanti offering repeated obeisances and saying, Alas, why did I take birth as a woman? If I had taken birth as a man, I could easily have entered this Kunja, taken Darshan of the great souls, and become purified by taking their foot dust on my head. May I simply become the servitor of the Vaishnavas of Sri Navadweep birth after birth, and spend my days in their service. Yadavadas said, Ah, this Godrumadam is a perfectly sacred place. Simply by coming here, one obtains Shuddha Bhakti. Godruma is a cowherd village, the place where Sachinandan, the lord of our life, enacts his divine pastimes. In his heart, Sri Prabodhananda Saraswati realized this truth and prayed in the following words. Na loka vedodrita marga bedea, avisya sanklisyate re vimudha, ha te na sarvam parihritya gode, shri godrume parana kutim kuru dvam. O fools, although you have taken shelter of worldly society and the Vedas, and adopted many social and religious duties, you remain miserable. Now give up these dubious paths, and quickly build yourself a leaf hut in shri godruma. In this way, exchanging Harikata, the three crossed the Ganga and arrived at Kuliagram. Thenceforward, both Chandidas and his wife Damayanti displayed a wonderful Vaishnav demeanor. Untouched by the world of Maya, they became adorned with the qualities of Vaishnava Seva. Blessed are the merchant couple. Blessed is the mercy of the Vaishnavas. Blessed is Sri Navadweep Bhumi. Thus ends the seventh chapter of Jivadharma entitled Nitya Dharma and Material Existence.